Hmm. You know, I've been sitting back there wondering, am I going to get frozen? Am I going to be able to be able to speak? And uh, I was thinking of something that James Baldwin once said which is that there are two very important moments in our lives. The day we're born and the day we find out why. As I was looking at all the faces just before I was getting ready to talk, I was thinking all these young faces, all excited and scared, full of dreams and hopes and life all in front of you. Well, I got lucky. For 25 years, I was a teacher. Special ed, junior high kids in San Francisco. And what I really discovered was not only did I love children, but I was really good with them. And every day was just incredible. So how did I get here? What happened? In 1995, January 31st, a dramatic thing, event changed the course of my life. I was in my classroom and I was teaching. And then the principal came to the door. And he said, you need to come with me right now. And he called me into his office. And he said, you need to go home. Your mother has been kidnapped. And I remember thinking, that's impossible. I had just seen him, seen her three or four days ago. And so when I drove home, I kept thinking this couldn't be happening. This only happened to someone else. I only read about it in the newspaper. And then when I got home, my two roommates told me I needed to go to my sister's home. And they were crying. And when I drove to my sister's home, I kept thinking somehow I could rescue my mom, that I could find maybe the car or, and follow them and rescue my mother. And then as I came around the corner to my mom's home, to my sister's home, there was my niece crying in the front lawn. And then it was then that I knew my mother was gone. On January 31st, 1985, an African-American young man broke into my mother's front door and shot her five times in the head. And then he went down the hill and he killed three other women. Those are the facts of how my mother died. And when people ask me, those are some of the things I said. But in truth, I was devastated. I was so traumatized that I started to get an ulcer. The doctors recommended that I give up teaching, something that I so dearly loved. And for three years, I was absolutely lost. And finally, I went into therapy to deal with the violence, the trauma, I then, later on, became a therapist and began working with men who were violent and on the issues of racism. So I started an Asian men's group and a multicultural men's group, and then suddenly the American Psychological Association heard about my work, and they said, I sure wish you could film your work. And so my very first film was stolen ground, racism towards Asian Americans and Asians. And it won such great acclaim that I decided to do a film called The Color of Fear with men of all different ethnicities. And then that won the best documentary in the United States. People literally were running down hallways talking about the film. And then, in 1995, Oprah Winfrey heard about it and wanted to do a two-hour special in my life, and of course, then after that, my whole life changed. 
And during my travels showing the film, one day I showed it to 600 people standing room only in Sacramento, California. And I told the story of how I lost my mom and how it deeply affected my life. And then out of the audience, a woman stood up and cried and screamed, Oh my God, it was my son who killed your mother. And I walked off the stage in the middle of 600 people as we held each other. And I cried for her son as she cried for my mother. It is still very hard for me to talk about it. I miss her every day. And then when I went back to school, I told the secretary what had happened. And she looked at me and said, I've been scared to tell you this because I didn't want to traumatize you more. But when moi, Anthony, the man who killed your mother, was a student at our school 15 years ago. And I looked at her and I said, what do you mean? And she said, yes, he was here. And so I said, what happened? And she said, he was caught gambling in the bathroom. In those days, they didn't know what to do with young black boys. And so they decided to transfer him. Anthony screamed and cried and held on to the bathroom door. Please don't transfer me. My friends and my family are here. But they transferred him. And 15 years later, he found his way to my mother's front door. Ah, it's been so many years now. But I have wondered all those many years. What if somebody had said to Anthony, no, we're not going to transfer you. No. I want to find out your life, Anthony. What if they put their arms around him and simply said, I want to find out, find out how we failed you. I want to, f- want to find out about your life and about your family. I want to figure out a way how we could teach you to bring you back into the classroom. Perhaps my life would have been very different. And I wouldn't be standing in front of all of you today I think sometimes our lives change. All around today, when I look around this country, with all the shootings and killings and even one yesterday, I wonder when are we going to stop and look what we're doing. And all the children who have picked up guns Do you know that after Parkland, it was just on Valentine's Day, uh, Parkland, the shooting? And that since Parkland took place, when 17 young people were killed, 1,200 young people have lost their lives due to gun violence. And we often say to pray and hope that things will get better. But when will we ever stop? to truly do something. Today, when I look around the country, I keep thinking, we're screaming and yelling at each other, picking up guns as a last resort or a first resort. We aren't sitting down and really truly talking to each other. The title of my talk is, Curiosity is the Gateway to Empathy. When will we want to learn about each other's lives? All of you are seated here today. 
Do you know the national conversation on race? Everybody talked to a panel, but nobody talked to each other. Every single discriminatory act that takes place in this country, do you know we never have the perpetrator and the victim sit down and talk to each other? To truly sit down and hear why did, how it felt to be hurt, how it felt to be discriminated against. And so the person can learn, not just say, I'm sorry, but to find out what they did and why. And so when I'm standing in front of you today, for 33 years now, since that moment of my mother's death, I have been doing this work. I came here to TED because I just got into a car accident in which a car hit me and threw me in the air. I had a concussion. But at that one moment, I thought my life could be over. And I wondered to myself, what have I done in all these years when I look, out, look back? Did I try to make this a better world? Did I help the people next to me? And I can honestly say that I've been touched and moved by the people in my life. As we get ready for the next elections, this is what I would love to say to this president. To tell him a story that Richard M. Nixon, about Richard M. Nixon, and what Richard M. Nixon did at election time. He ran against a young man by the name of John F. Kennedy. At midnight, Richard M. Nixon knew he was going to lose. And so he went downstairs into the presidential kitchen to get a sandwich. And there was Rafael, a Latino young man, working in the kitchen. And Richard M. Nixon looked at him and said, so who are you voting for? The young man said, I'm not telling you. And Richard F. Nixon said, no, I really want to know, who are you voting for? And Raphael said, I'm voting for the other guy. And Nixon looked at him and said, why? I have all the experience. He, he's just the first, second year congressman. How could you possibly vote for him? I really want to know. And with tears in his eyes, Raphael looked at him and said, I voted for John F. Kennedy because he made me feel good about myself and he made me feel good about others. Isn't that what a president should be doing? Isn't that what all good teachers do? Principals, governors, senators, congressmen folks. To make you feel good about yourself and to feel good about others. To me, that is the way to bring this country together. I think that if Anthony had had someone tell him how good they felt about him, and to bring out his best gifts, perhaps my life would have been very different. And so today, as I'm standing in front of you, on the anniversary of my mother's murder, I hope you will never have to go through what I did. Mother Teresa was right. Perhaps we have no peace because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. I thank you.